So good morning and uh, welcome to the third lecture in discrete math. So today we're approaching the central topic of our course, which is the polynomial versus non-polynomial or non-deterministically polynomial problems. So P versus NP, P and NP. And uh, for today we discuss all the decision problems. So it's algorithmic question with only one bit of answer, which is yes or no. So, of course, there are many more complicated problems, and we'll discuss them later, uh, connected to decision ones. Uh, the reason is actually very simple. It's because um, the decision problem gives you one bit, and, well, technically speaking, any other problem is just a series of decision problems, because any answer is a series of zeros and ones. But it's only a rough intuition, of course, this is just the simplest problems we can consider. So the simplest possible answer is yes or no. But the input is something well, probably quite complicated. So it's, it could be a formula, it could be some discrete object like a graph, we'll discuss graphs next time, or something like that. The answer is just yes or no. And for the convenience that also the input data be a word of an alphabet. So it's maybe also a sigma can be also zeros and ones, so it could be just a string of Zeros and ones is the usual presentation of any sort of data in uh, a computer memory. So this is just uh, for your say, sake of your convenience. Uh, in the running examples we had, we had Boolean formula. A Boolean formula is a string of symbols, like in your say practical class. So there is the size of the input, which is the length of the input in symbols. Uh, it doesn't matter how many letters are there in the alphabet because you can always encode them with only linear growth of the length of the string. You can encode them with zeros and ones. And the decision problem is in the polynomial class called P. If there exists an algorithm for solving the problem whose worst case running time is bounded by a polynomial of x, of the length of x. So what is worst case running time? So for each uh, so for each x, the running time should be bounded by uh, this polynomial. Uh, it means that there are even the so on some data the algorithm could run faster, on some it could run slower, but uh, always it should be bounded. So even the worst case should be bounded by a polynomial. P is an arbitrary polynomial which depends only on the problem. It does not depend on the input, of course. So its argument is the length of the input, but the, say the degree of the polynomial is fixed. And we are talking about quadratic algorithms, cubic algorithms, etc. And uh, as I said in the previous lecture, why we are talking about polynomiality? Because it's quite robust. That uh, it is much more independent of the details of the encoding and the details of your computational model. Uh, recall that we didn't discuss concrete computational models now. We didn't discuss the Turing machines or RAM machines or something like that. If you transcode your algorithms between different models of computation, your exact complexity bounds could change. So, and many, many details are there, but if you are talking about polynomiality, it's robust. And uh, that's why we choose it. And this is a rough approximation of being, say, computably tractable. So, um, if you are polynomial, there is a hope that this could be implemented and run fast. If it's exponential, as they say, non-polynomial, there's usually no hope, but again, there are exceptions. So it's an approximation. This is the P class, quite clear. So just usual algorithms working quite fast. And the NP class is something more complicated. And there are several equivalent definitions of the NP. So NP stands for non-deterministic polynomials, not say not polynomial, because there are many problems who are even harder than NP. But uh, two several cool definitions will take, I think, two of them. Definition number one is non-deterministic computations. So um, here the computation process may branch. At some point of execution, there could be more than one possibilities to perform the next step. A finite number of possibilities. You can say that there are always two possibilities, because otherwise you just make several points of branching. What does this mean? In a usual computational system, the machine always knows what to do. So there's a specific instruction which tells it, if that, then do that. If that, then do that. In a non-deterministic computation, at some point, 
there could be many, several options. So there are several possible next steps. So the machine could make, as they say, non-deterministic guess. Uh, so the typical situation that it says, say, give me a non-deterministic bit of information, yes or no. It's like flipping a coin. But uh, so you know that you toss a coin and either heads or tails, this gives you a random bit of information. But this non-deterministic is not the same as being random because there's no probability involved here. So we don't compute the probability of something, but we just uh, consider all possible computational tracks of this machine. So what is the consequence of that? That if in a de deterministic case, you have one execution trajectory, one execution trace, then now you have several of them. So it, it, it could branch. And uh, different ways of computation could yield different answers, right? So we are trying to solve a decision problem. And uh, on one path of computation, it could, the answer could be yes. On the other, it could be no. And this is the power of non-determinism. Because if the answer is always the same, we don't need non-deterministic choices. We can always make a specific choice and make our algorithm deterministic. And then what is the answer? How would we answer? And this is called angelic choice. So if at least one execution trajectory yields yes, then we give the answer yes. So while angelic, well, it's a, say, a sort of wishful thinking. We wish the algorithm to return yes. We wish our result to be yes. We wish to answer positively. And if we manage to, if there is at least one way of guessing such that the answer is positive, then they will say it's positive. If there is no way, then it's negative, only in this case. Question. Sorry, if, if, we have one, if we have only one branch for number of three cases, if we choose one of them, it's like deterministic of that. Yeah, if always one of them is deterministic, yes. Uh, so, no, no, if we have a branch and then we go from one of them, it's become a deterministic. Yes, yes, yes. If we always, do all, if we always have a determin determination and choice. But, so for example, you have a coin which always gives you heads. It's deterministic. But here, what is angelic choice? We should choose the right, in a sense, trajectory. We don't know it in advance. But it means that the deterministic machine is something like, well, it's a mythological object. It does not exist, of course. Why? Because it, it, at some point, the machine could make the right guess. So the standard example is the non-deterministic guess. For example, satisfy an assignment or next lecture will have Hamiltonian cycles and graphs. So how can a non-deterministic machine quickly solve the satisfiability problem, for example? It just says, OK, instead of uh, trying to apply a resolution or doing something like that, I will just guess the satisfying assignment. I will non-deterministically guess all the bits. And due to angelic choice, if there is a satisfying assignment, then there is a computational trajectory which will yield yes, and the angelic choice will give you this. If, uh, if there is no satisfying assignment, no one will help you. And even any angelic choice will give you no, because of so. Hamiltonian cycle, again, Hamiltonian cycle in the graph is a cycle which reverses all the vertices exactly once if you know what a graph is. Um, again, you can guess it. You just look at the graph and say, OK, I guess it like that. I first go this way, then this way, then this way. So you can think that there is an angel sitting behind you who gives you good hints. Of course, this should be a part of the implementation of such a machine, which is practically impossible. But this is just a, what you can call theoretical model of computation. So you can talk about it. So it's not a real machine. The non-deterministic machine is nothing. And unfortunately, even say quantum computing and some stuff like that are not that as powerful as this one is. So technically, we even don't know that the problem is decidable without these hints, without the angel. But uh, we'll see that it is decidable, but it's Ethereum. So another definition makes the hints more explicit. And the idea is as follows. OK, let's denote the decision problem by A of x. So x is uh, the input, and A is 0 or 1, depending on the input, the result of the computation. Just one moment. OK, these people are there. It's OK. It's a chat. So A of x, A 
is the result or the algorithm which will give you the result. And we write down this scary formula. We have an R, which is a polynomial relation. And we say that we yield one. If we don't leave, there exists a Y such that R of X, Y gives you zero. And also Y should have polynomial size. So what does this mean? We, how do we solve our problem? We have to guess. So besides the input X, we have another input which we call hints. So there is some extra information given. And when this is given, you can easily solve your problem. But without this information, the problem could be hard. Why is the set of hints? It's just bits of information. And the size of Y should be small, should be also polynomial. So the angel cannot give you too much information on a polynomial amount of. And uh, R is a polynomial relation, so you can be solved in polynomial type. Again, for satisfiability, we don't know how to solve it polynomially. We don't know how to, we were given a formula, we are staring at it, and we don't know whether it is satisfying assignment. The only way to solve it, say, you can try all of them, but it's exponential. You can try resolution, it also can lead you to exponential blow up. Etc. Etc. And here, uh, suppose you are allowed to be, be given a hint, and then you ask for a hint. Just show me the satisfying assignment. And if the satisfying assignment is given, then checking for uh, it really being a satisfying assignment, this is a easy polynomial time solvable problem. Uh, so this is called a hint, and it's given by someone by Angel to help us solve the problem. And the examples of why we satisfy an assignment, a cycle in a graph. And stuff like that. So all, most of the problems where you are asked something like, does there exist an object with given properties? These are naturally in the NP class. Because finding such an object or determining there is no such object is hard. But if you are given this object as a hint, usually checking it is easy. Sometimes this is not the case because sometimes checking could be hard. Sometimes the object could be enormous, it could be more than polynomial size, but usually this is the situation. And the satisfiability for Boolean formula is quite a generic example of such situation. So you are searching for some Boolean combination, so basically a string of zero and one. It's a very generic object in the field map, and you uh, find out. These two definitions are equivalent, so recall that the first one is non deterministic computations when you can branch, and the angel gives, so the difference is actually as follows. In definition one, the angel gives you hints during your computational process, so when you ask for them, when you want to, to do an undeterministic branching. In definition two, the angel gives you all the hints in the beginning. So you have to, have to take Y as a hint, and then all the computation process should be polynomial and deterministic, and no extra recall to the, to, for, for help to others. So, they're actually equivalent, so from two to one, it's easy that if you have an undeterministic machine, you can just start with guessing all the hint, all the bits of Y, and then proceed just deterministically. For the other way, it could be not so easy because uh, there is more power that you have. You can ask for hints during your process. You can ask for hints not just in the beginning, but during your process, when you already computed something, this looks like something more, say, more powerful, more, uh, more possibilities for you, but it's actually the same. And the proof is as follows. So suppose that each branching is binary. You can always do it, of course. But at each point, when you want to, um, to do non-deterministic choice, you actually toss a coin, so one or zero. And then the hint can be made just a sequence of choices to be made. So suppose this is the a non-deterministic process. So these are all, the blue ones are all possible branches, and the red one in the middle is uh, the branch which we actually took. And we say that if at a non-deterministic point we go up, it's choice one. If we go down, it's choice zero. And this means that the, the se sequence of choices may be encoded by the following number, zero, one, zero, zero, right? So once we go up and other times we go down. And then we can actually pre-ask for this as a hint from the angel. And given this, we just keep this information and then we just proceed by usual deterministic algorithm because for each point of, of non-determinism we take the appropriate bit from Y 
and say we'll go this way. We know already what to do. Uh, but we know the count of uh, these patients. Uh, yeah, about the count is a good question. We don't know it, but it's bounded by the total. Uh, so we know that the algorithm should have polynomial bound on the running time, and this this is the polynomial bound which bounds the number of branches in particular, because not every step is a branching one, though, so it's actually less, but it's not a lot bigger. So, yeah, it's true that, and you can see it in this picture, by the way, that the number of uh, branching points differs in different ways. So if you go up, then you have only two of them, and here you have four. But it's not, it's, it's not harmful, because uh, you can give, take the biggest possible hint, and if you just stop your algorithm before you used all the uh, elements of the hint, well, we just don't use it. It's okay, but it's a good good point that uh, since your running time is polynomial, then you never need more than a polynomial number of hints, polynomial number of bits of points of non-determinism, and uh, therefore uh, the size of y is always polynomial. And it's important since it's the part of the, of the definition you need to. Here, q is actually basically p. It's the same. Polynomial. Okay, so it is clear that the uh, P class two definitions and the generic problem is uh, satisfiability. So again, you can either guess your satisfying assignment or you can uh, just uh, ask it before the hint. It's the same. And trivially, P is a subset of NP. So if a problem is solvable polynomially, just deterministic polynomial algorithm, of course you can say, okay, I also accept any sort of hints, I just don't need them. If I can solve it polynomially, I just... Uh, so a deterministic algorithm can be considered as a say, basic version of a non-deterministic one, because it just never branches. But it could branch, but it doesn't want so. And if you, you are given a hint and you say, well, thank you, but I can do it myself. So I just you ignore y and just solve the polynomial. And nobody knows whether this inclusion is strict. So, for example, SAT or 3SAT. So 3SAT is a satisfiability problem for 3CNF. Nobody knows whether it is P or not. It's definitely in NP, but maybe not in P. And this is uh, something tricky. So here, as I said, I mean, in both of the previous lectures, that uh, we're in a, in a case where uh, uh, the main, say, question of the field is an open problem. It's not so, so say, frequent in science, where, or say, in math, where the main question which all, on which everything is based is unknown. Nobody knows the answer. And uh, this makes complexity theory quite a peculiar area where you... Mm, Instead of proving things, we do some, what I said here, ersatz, so some substitute, uh, that uh, we do not know the answer, but we uh, suppose some conjectures, and from these conjectures we derive the theory. And this is the theory of NP completeness. So, informally speaking, NP complete problems are the hardest possible problems in NP. So, uh, we wish to say that 3SAT or SAT is not solvable polynomial. We know that it is in NP. And uh, we don't know whether it is in P. But we shall prove that um, it's the hardest possible problem in a sense in NP. So if it is polynomial, everything else is polynomial. So in, if, if an NP complete problem is solvable in polynomial time, then P equals NP. And contraposition that if P is not NP, which is highly likely from practice, then any NP complete problem is not NP. So this is if you prove something being NP complete, prove it being hard. Then uh, you give a good conjecture that it is not polynomial. But it's not a mathematical theory. And this is performed by Karp reduction or M reduction. So we say that one problem is M reducible to another if there exists a polynomial computable function which reduces it. So, uh, beware, these letters P and M here are not parameters, they are just markers, that this is a polynomial M reduction. So, M is for M reduction, or Karp reduction, 
MS over for multi one or something like that, don't mind. It's just the personal name. And P is for polynomial. So uh, what does the how does this work? So how does the reduction work? So suppose that we have a way of solving B. Some good way of solving B. How do we solve A? We take X, we pre-process it and make f of x and after pre-processing it we run the algorithm for b so if an algorithm for b is efficient and since f is polynomial then this way of computing a is also polynomial or efficient in a sense so this means that a is at least not harder than b so if we can, if we, once we manage to prove B, to, to solve, solve B, we immediately solve A. So using B and F, we try to uh, add an, an, an analog to A? We, we, yeah, but not analog, algorithm, just algorithm. So it's, it's reduction. So how do you, it's, well, well, you reduce one problem to another. So it means that uh, you suppose that B is solvable, you know how to solve it. And now we want to solve A, and solving A for X is the same as solving B for some image of X, which is easily computable. And the problem is called NP hard if any problem in NP is reducible to it. And NP complete is a problem which is both NP hard and it is in NP. So you see that NP hard problems could be beyond NP, they could be harder. But if a problem is itself NP, and at the same time it's NP hard, we call such problems NP complete. So this is the complexity picture. You see that this is the class, so this is the picture in the case P is not equal to NP. Uh, so here you see that uh, you have NP class. On the bottom, the easy problems are P, polynomial. And on top, you have the NP hard problems. And uh, the intersection of NP and NP harder than NP complete problems. And so if P is not equal to NP, this picture does not collapse. So if P equals NP, everything collapses. And P, P, and NP complete are the same. But here you have NP complete problems. They're not polynomial. You have two say, hard problems, easy problems. You also could have something in the middle. And actually, there are theorems that they exist intermediate problems. What I'm going to discuss it in this course, but. Usually, most of the problems either in NP either fall here in the bottom, so they're easy, sol solvable quickly, or they can be put in the, on the top and you prove that they're NP complete. They're hard. So, this is the usual dichotomy. It's not always the case. As I said, there could be problems which are here, which are intermediate complexity level. But this is if P is not equal to NP. If it happens that P equals NP, of course, this picture collapses. You have only one class which is P and then P at the same time, and then P com all problems are at the same time polynomial and then P complete. This is the degenerate situation, but it could be possible in the real world. Here we have this, this situation in which people usually believe. So, we will see some reductions in, in the future lectures, so now just a uh, theoretical example that you can reduce something to something so uh, if you wish to say if you know how to solve say boolean satisfiability for example that then you can and if you can express something in in terms of boolean satisfying then this you can reduce it so it's, it's also in np so proving that the problem is np complete gives an evidence that it is hard and probably not all the time solvable. And the common method of proving NP hardness is backwards reduction. So suppose we know already an NP hard problem, and then we want to show that another problem B is NP hard, then we need to reduce the old problem to the new one. And this is a very important point, I want to emphasize it, because if you want to show that something is easy, you can do a reduction in the forward direction. So you know that B is easy, and you know how to reduce A to B, then A is also easy, right? 
because you, you can you have an algorithm which works via this reduction. If you want to show that something is hard, then it's meaningless to reduce something, to reduce it to something hard, because you have a, prob you have a problem B. If you reduce it to a hard problem, it does not mean that it B, B was hard, because when you do this reduction, you uh, just uh, you reduce a, a, maybe you have a simpler solution. So many things can be done in a hard way, but maybe there are easy ways. Uh, but if you reduce a problem which is already known to be hard to your problem, then your problem is also hard. So the reduction goes in a backward direction, here, as written in this text. So this is the the, the thing, right? So. You, Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. okay. Uh, and there is only one question. How to bootstrap the situation and obtain the first example of an NP-complete problem? So you see that this backwards reduction method says the following. We already have a hard problem, an NP-complete problem, and we reduce something, something, and say that the other problem was also hard. But how do you find the first one? And how do you prove that SAT is NP hard? And we'll do it, but not, 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 not now. And it's Kuklevin theorem. Uh, that um, satisfiability for arbitrary Boolean formulae is NP complete. So, um, the concrete example of a NP problem, which is hard, is satisfiability for Boolean formula. A typical example of NP complete problem. I will now shift to another pack of slides and we'll continue. Uh, so okay, new question. Yeah. Uh, bootstrap, well, it's uh, the bootstrap process to start a process. So it's, uh, uh, you see that here, well, what is the problem here? That you having already one NP pro NP complete problem, you can make another problem being NP complete, right? Uh, but uh, this, um, uh, yeah, but uh, how to start the process? How to prove that at least one concrete problem is in Pika? So what, what is in the, Let's see this this picture once more. No, the, first yeah. the first example, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so what 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 is actually the main idea of uh, this NP completeness business? It is that uh, okay, you have P, and then you have NP, which is a bigger class, right? So suppose we know that P is not equal to NP. This is the con conjecture we usually use in our considerations in, throughout all the course and throughout all these all these uh, discussions, because otherwise we we don't know. And this means that there are some problems which are an NP but not P. So we know that there exist hard problems. There exist hard problems. But now we need to make this concrete. We need to prove that this particular problem is hard. And this is absolutely different thing. So just to know that there are hard problems is not the same as proving that a concrete problem is hard. And the theorem of NP-completeness says us, OK, if we uh, know that a, some problem is hard, and this problem is re can be reduced to something, then the other problem is also hard. And this is just by transitivity of reduction, actually. Okay, so if, if anything can reduce that. So, uh, but uh, how to show that one problem is hard? And this is going to be not so easy, uh, because when we talk about this, uh, we... Um, mm, how to say it? Uh, so we have to reduce all NP problems to this problem. So if we have a concrete problem, say SAT, and we wouldn't wish to show that it's NP hard, we need to take an arbitrary NP problem and reduce it to that. Okay? Yes. 
Yes, yes, yes. So this, let's just shift to the other pack of slides and we'll uh, continue. So, and this is Kuklevin theorem. We, should, we, we claim that satisfiability of arbitrary Boolean formula is NP complete. So that is if A is in the class NP, any problem which is in NP class, then this problem is M reducible to set. So this looks something like, well, how to how in the world could we prove that? Because there is an arbitrary NP problem. We don't know what it is about. We just have an arbitrary non-deterministic polynomial algorithm which does something, and uh, we can reduce it to set. But this is actually that idea which I explained, well, uh, last lectures that uh, Boolean satisfiability is a generic uh, decision thing. It's generic. It's something which uh, can encode anything. When you ask for an object which satisfies certain conditions and it's in the polynomial, polynomially decidable world, uh, then uh, we can uh, express this object as a boolean string of polynomial size right and uh, this uh, boolean string has to satisfy some condition right and this condition can be expressed as a boolean formula and therefore searching for an object with given properties of bounded size is the same as searching for satisfying an assignment of a Specific Boolean formula, and this is the reduction. So we take our problem, our original problem, and we transform it into a Boolean satisfiability problem. This is the general idea. And let's start with an example. And here, um, the notion of graph comes into play. So, um, as I said in the beginning of the class, of the course this uh, year, that we'll have Boolean formula which are the most generic uh, model of uh, problems in discrete mathematics. This is one side. But on the other side, we, uh, have, uh, we need to have something more vivid because um, graphs, uh, because Boolean formula is something really abstract. So what does it mean? Zeros, ones, substitutions, etc. cetera. Uh, but uh, here, um, uh, we have an example of an end, we have also we have to have something which is more visual, visualized and stuff. Like the graphs are a good example. And this is we had a problem which is three colorability of graphs. And let's first recall what a graph is. So now we stop for a bit talking about Kuklevin and uh, um, P and then P. We are told, well, so quickly discuss what a graph is. So an undirected graph is formed by a set of vertices, and some of them are connected by edges. So this is a typical graph. And there are many uh, variants of that. So there is directed graph where edges have arrows. So for each edge, you know which is the beginning, which is the end. In an undirected graph, you don't know that. And there are specific kind of edges. There could be a loop, a vertex which connected to itself. It, it could be also directed loop. And also the parallel edges, the two vertices connected more than one edge. And by default, loops and parallel edges are disallowed. If we are talking just about a graph, usually we disallow loops and parallel edges. If they are allowed, then we just specifically say about it. A graph with parallel edges is called a multigraph, and a graph with parallel edges loops is called pseudograph. It's just I uh, introduced this uh, terminology for you to, if you read literature. In Russian, it's absolutely the same, multigraph. And know that in a directed graph, you can have this situation where there are two edges which go in different directions between the same vertices. These are not considered parallel. If they go in one direction, they are parallel, but this is just, you can have this. And graphs are virtually everywhere. So applications of graphs, you have maps, or geographical information system where vertices are some cities or some places and edges are roots. Um, in chemistry, say graphs of molecular structure, organic chemistry, 
internet, network topology. It's like geographical informational system, but these are not physical rules, but they are just uh, connections between computers in the network. Um, in linguistics, syntactic dependence and syntactic structures are modeled by graph theoretic means. Social network analysis will have a um, task on that in this homework number three. And uh, a social network, again, it's like geography, it's like a uh, computer network, but you have people or some entities. And among them, you will have these are edges, it could be directed edges, like subscribing to one some to another. It could be symmetric like friends or something like that. Again, it's many, many things like that. And now formal definition again, dull. So a pseudo graph is defined formally as set of edges where these vertices and E is edges. And if it is a graph, then you can just say that E is a set of pairs. So you have just pairs of edges. And if it is undirected, then you will have that symmetric sense. Binary relational center. There's not a pseudograph, it's a graph. It's a pseudo and directed is symmetric irreflexive. And directed graph is an arbitrary irreflexive relation. And for multigraphs, it's more involved. But so uh, coloring. What is the coloring problem? We color vertices into colors of a set C. And we say that the coloring is correct if each edge connects vertices of different colors. It's just, there's old, old, old problems of uh, coloring graphs in, uh, um, say, coloring maps in colors. So you have a map, geographical map, you want to color it, and you don't, do not want to have bordering areas having the same color, because they do not you know, distinguish them. And uh, this, therefore, the correctness condition is that the edges and vertices should have different colors. So formally, it's a uh, mapping from V to C, so from the set of vertices to the set of colors, with the constraint that if U V is an edge, then C of U is not the same as C of V. As three coloring, it's C where the set of colors is say red, green, blue. For example, this graph is recoverable. You see that the, 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 we, will, we will not, of course, write these functions as say, no, no, tables or something like that. We shall write them as, just draw them on the graphs, just like that, right? And this one is not. So it's a variant of this graph. We added a vertex in the, in the middle. And you see that this could not be colored in three colors. Why? Well, um, uh, why not three? So, okay. These are five vertices in this loop, in this cycle, right? So, one, two, three, four, five. And you cannot color them in two colors, right? Because if you take this red, green, red, green, oops, it's neither red nor green. Therefore, for coloring this pentagon, you need at least three colors. And the point in the middle has to be different from all of them. It should be the fourth one. And the three colorability problem, which is the given a graph, also whether it belongs, whether it's three colorable, it clearly belongs to the NP class, right? Because uh, the non deterministic guess of coloring is a hint. So we go and ask for, 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 for the color. Yep. So we, we just take each vertex and ask for the color. And when we colored everything, we check that the color is correct. There are no two vertices connected by an edge which have the same color. Angelic choice. If the color exists, then the angel will give us the color. If not, well, then we also know. Of course, there could be bad trajectories when we did bad guesses, but we ignore them. Clearly an NP problem. And this is a particular case of cook levin theorem, which states that three color is reducible to set. So, um, for any graph, G, we construct a Boolean formula, phi, G, which is satisfiable if and only if the graph is three-colorable. So, this is going to be our problem by now. How to construct such a formula. So, we need to encode the question of colorability as satisfiability. 
and the reducing function will be polynomial computable. And actually, here the reduction will be just one to one. So each three coloring will correspond exactly to one satisfying assignment. And the idea is quite easy. So we have a finite number of vertices. So again, the, we have a graph, and for this fixed graph, we need to obtain this fixed Boolean formula. So the graph is finite, and uh, it has a finite number of vertices, and we introduce three times more variables. For each vertex, we say that uh, these elementary propositions will be encoded as Boolean variable. So R is being red, G is being green, P is being blue. And then we need to write down the natural uh, conditions on these. And these conditions will give you, will uh, actually will be uh, they will be expressible as Boolean formula, Boolean expressions. And this is the big, big Boolean formula. Let's take a look at it. So this is the conjunction for all V, for any. So the, the first big conjunction starts here and ends here. That's the first two lines. Uh, this conjunction is uh, the condition on each vertex individually. What do we say about each vertex? First, it should have a color. It's either red or green or blue. And it has only one color, so it cannot be red and green simultaneously, or red and blue, or blue and green. So it has one color and exactly one. And this makes it a coloring. And this, the third line makes the correct coloring. It says that if uh, we have an edge, then uh, it should be not all red, not all green, and not all blue. So at least one of it is not red, and one of it is not green, one of it is not red. So this says that any two adjacent vertices have different colors. And three colorings of G and satisfying assignments of phi G are in one-to-one -one correspondence here. So if you manage to color the graph in three colors, you can satisfy this formula just taking the correspondence. So if vertex number I is, say, red, then Ri is 1, and Gi and Pi are 0, right? And we say that, uh, yeah, and, and then we're done. This assignment will satisfy the formula, right? Because it's exactly what is written there, that each vertex has a color, no vertex has two colors simultaneously, and the color is correct. That if two vertices are connected, they have different colors. Is it enough? So we show this formula, and then it's okay. It's yes, another question. Is this a question? Okay. I mean, uh, how we uh, show in this formula that they are connected? So e. You see this E. This set of edges. Uh, e and K, they are like... Uh, yeah, I and K. I and, I and K. K, we consider they are uh, this, the neighbors, yes? Yes, yes. So e, the set E is exactly the set of edges. It's the set of connections. Pairs, yeah. Ah, so E and K, there are, there are this vertex, they are connected. So yes, so because this is E, yeah, this... So this, this is the second I conjunction understand, understand. They, they is to, to this idea, so set of edges. It's not all the all the pairs. Okay. Otherwise, it's meaningless. So yeah, the the, the other direction. Yeah. All right. So uh, if you have a coloring, you satisfy this formula. Now suppose you how somehow manage to satisfy the formula, and you have a satisfying assignment, and from this assignment you can read the uh, coloring of the graph, right? Because you satisfy this. You know that for each vertex, exactly one of these three variables is true. It's guaranteed by the first two lines. And you make the, you know which one is true, and you make this the color of our thing. Having this the color, you uh, uh, then look at the third line and notice that this is a correct coloring, because otherwise one of these clauses will get violated. So it's, it's, it's the same. So coloring and uh, satisfying assignment, correct color and satisfying assignment is the same. So it's just, uh, it's how logic works. It's the way of uh, expressing your informal, say, uh, phrase in, in a logical language. In, so here, even this trivial logical language of uh, classical Boolean propositional logic is sufficient in order to make your uh, uh, 
uh, so your satisfying assignment is the same as uh, how can you call it so, uh, the, uh, this color and this is what I uh, advertised last lecture so uh, previous lecture it's uh, that if you wish to find an object with given properties you encode this object as a satisfying assignment as an assignment with an assignment and this and your condition is expressed as a boolean form so it's exactly the formal way of representing that uh, it's a correct coloring right and by this way uh by the way yes it is a 3 cnf it's by accident but it's going to be quite a generic thing we're going to reduce this well, it's, actually, yeah, it's just, just formally it's a cnf right yeah and each uh it, um, no, no more than three, so something in, in teams. First conjunction, yes. There was a question that the first conjunction says that, uh, yes, each vertex has only one color of RGB. Yeah, this, this, this is right here. Yeah. So this was a question in the chat. Okay, so, yeah, it says three CNF. Just by, well, this is quite, by the way, quite a common thing. Because usually, what are your sorts of uh, conditions? It's a big conjunction usually. You want your your object to satisfy this and this and this and this, and you will have a conjunction of something. And what are the conjuncts? What they, if you are lucky, they could be of this good form of CNF clauses, of C elementary conjunctions, or some implications maybe or something like that. We could have been lucky and make it a two CNF. And we'll see it in one, I think, in one of the next classes. And this means that if set were solvable in polynomial time, then so would have been three color, right? In reality, of course, we do not know polynomial algorithm for set, and such reductions actually give some evidence against its existence. So you see that if we had a polynomial algorithm for set, then the world would have been too, too good for us. Uh, and the idea of Cook Levin theorem is that any NP guessing can be represented as guessing a satisfying assignment for a Boolean problem. So, if we solve the Boolean problem, or formula problem, problem we solve any NP? Yes, so it's a generic NP problem. Actually, any any NP problem can be re, can be represented, it can be reduced, it can be represented as solving the satisfiability. So, it's basically the same. And this is the good example. So we, you see that uh, it, it makes it quite more, say, plausible that Cook Levin would be true and provable, because um, we have a, something absolutely heterogeneous generic. We have something which is not about Boolean formula; it's about graphs. But we know that the Boolean language is expressible enough to talk about such objects, in particular graphs. Sometimes reduction to SAT also yield positive results. And uh, mm, how could it work? So as I said before, and I'm saying many times, we don't know whether P equals NP. We suppose that P is not equal to NP. And if it's the case, then SAT is not solvable in polynomial time, right? Therefore, such reductions could be meaningless, right? Because we reduced our problem to something for which we do not know an algorithm, right? And uh, this is strange because we well, well and what is the what is the meaning of this reduction? Why why do, should why, how could we use it? We don't have a good thing. But actually, in practice, there are set solvers which are quite efficient. They are not polynomial, but they are quite efficient in practice. Um. One of the reasons why it could be the case is that we measure worst case complexity. And some instances which appear in practice could avoid such cases. So even the naive way. So what uh, way of SAT solving do we have by now, which we discussed in class? We have brute force, right? We can just try all the possible assignments and find out which is the good one. And the second one, Second possible approach is, uh, yeah, it, it first is just checking, yes. And the second is resolution. So with the first approach, 
uh, probably you could be lucky and say the first uh, possible, uh, say the first assignment gives you one. And then this is very quick. You just uh, say put all zeros and you immediately get one. This uh, gives you immediately the result. Of course, you could be unlucky and it will take you all say if the only the last one gives you one, then you have to check all of them. Don't know how to reorder them in order to make it. For resolution, the situation is even more interesting because we know that resolution can give you exponential blow up, but it is not required to. There are many CNFs, even not two CNFs, but just arbitrary CNFs, for which resolution is quite fast. So resolution in the worst case, and we'll see such a case today in the practical class, in the worst case, resolution gives you very bad efficiency, very bad complexity. But in the good cases, it could work quite well. We don't know in advance whether our case will be good or bad, because we just do the saturation procedure, we stop when we are saturated. It's normal, right? But uh, maybe it will give a special blow up, maybe not. But sometimes, and in practice, we see these examples that uh, in practice there could be good situations where even resolution works fast. And uh, what about these Cook Levin style reduction? So you see, we have a one and well known and famous and P hard problem which is SAT, satisfiability. So this problem, we don't know a polynomial algorithm, but it was studied by many people, and there is a competition of industrial SAT solvers. So really good industry does the job. So they are not polynomial, but for practical purposes, they could be actually sufficiently fast. And now suppose you have your own NP problem, like some strange coloring of something, for example. Not even this tree coloring, but you have maybe you, you even for graphs, you could have some non standard conditions. So, for example, you require that any triangle should include say, three different colors. Or, okay, or you disallow such triangles. You have your coloring in three colors, but no triangle should have all, all three, you know, have only two. This is a strange condition on the, on the graph. And of course, for such problems, nobody knows good, even say optimized algorithm like SAT. So this means that if you want to solve such a problem, you, you know that it's probably NP hard, you need to invent something. But if you have reduction to SAT, you can do this reduction, they just run an industrial SAT solver, hoping that it will work efficient enough. So this is the positive side of reductions. So even if these problems are not polynomial, they could be sort of practically interesting. And there are interesting uh, things about that, they say, in, my, in genomics, in bio mathematical biology. Sometimes people really use that. So they have some problems of, say, genetic optimization of some computations on genomes, and they're very specific, but they're very usable to SAT, and they use industrial SAT solvers, and it happens that in the practically valuable cases, they really work fast. So this is the positive side. Now we return to Cook Levin theorem. And um, okay, so before we go to Cook Levin, we have well, what, what do we have by now? We have reductions, one for one P problem to another. The problems which uh, are hard, so reduction is a measure, a measure of hardness. So the harder the problem is, the more problems can be reduced to it. So it's, of course, a pre order. So it's not, not linear. It's not just that you have two problems, you can always say which one is harder. They could not they could be not mutually reducible. They could have, say, different sorts of hardness. But if one problem is reducible to, to another one, then the second problem is definitely harder than the first one. Well, not easier. So it's, it's a non-strict inequality. It's not strict partial order on problems. And it's relative, of course, that if you have Two problems, uh, three problems, A reducible to B, B reducible to C, A reducible to C, of course, but as compositional reducing functions, this is easy. And we have these uh, hardest problems in the NP class, and one of them is SAT. And we see how various NP problems can be reduced to SAT. 
like scalable problem, for example. Graphs. And now, in order to prove Cook Levin theory, we need to show that any NP problem is reducible to set. And this requires a formal notion of what an algorithm is. Because by now we are still uh, too, say, uh, we have too vague notion of what algorithm which makes polynomial computation and stuff like that. And one of the definition is Turing machines. I think some of them heard about, or you heard about that, but uh, I will recall the definition quickly. Well, yeah, formal slide. It's may, may mainly for you to read it on, on offline, but uh, you have an external alphabet, an internal alphabet, set of states, starting final state, and a set of rules. How it works. So at each step, the machine keeps one of its states from Q in its internal memory. So the machine has a finite internal memory and infinite external memory. The external memory is the mm, line of uh, what we have here, it's external memory. And uh, Q is the uh, our, say, operational unit. Inside Q, we have this fast access memory. So this small Q, we know it at each time. But uh, this A is observed only if we look at it like this. So this is the arrow which shows which, so we can read this, at this, at this point, but not at other cells. In order to read other cells, we need to shift to them. And at each moment, only a finite part of the tape is populated by meaningful symbols, and the rest is peddled, peddled by some black symbols which is a specific symbol which says that this cell was not used. And the rules are as follows. So, PAQBD. So, we are, so this is the prerequisite for the rule and this is the conclusion. So, uh, if we are in state P and we observe letter A, then uh, what should we do? We should replace A with B in the cell we're observing. We we'll replace P with Q in our internal memory. So what we keep in our mind. And next we, ca we can move. So L means left, D means right, N means so no, no move. Right? So this uh, can rewrite symbols on the, on the K, can change our internal state. See, P could be equal to Q and A could be equal to B, so we're not obliged to rewrite, but we can do it. And uh, we can move, left or right. And the machine is deterministic if for any P and any A, there is only one rule, at most one rule of this form. So it's no branching parts, because if you have two rules of this form with different right-hand sides, then you are in state P, you know your state, you know your symbol you are observing, but the machine doesn't know where to move. It has two possibilities. Here it has only one deterministic machine. And a deterministic machine on a given input has a unique execution trajectory. Again, as we said, everything we said at the beginning of the lecture, but formalized. A concrete computational model. And in general, the trajectory may branch. So, um, <clears throat> Okay, yeah, the trajectory may branch because if you have two rules of this form, any of them can be applied. And there are different possible ways of computing. And once the machine runs into the state QF, final state, it stops successfully. And the word which is written on the tape is the output. The machine could, at some point, there could be problematic situations where the machine fails. It means it runs into a state which is not QF, but there is no rule. Then it's just for halt, it's failure. Another possible unsuccessful stop. And another possible bad situation is infinite run. Because uh, in general, for Turing machines, we do not have any sort of the polynomial bounds on the uh, running time. And without such bounds, uh, well, the machine could run into a loop, for example just the deadlock. It could return to the same configuration and stop forever. Or it could be not in a loop, but it could just say 
populate the so it could just go right, 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 right. It's not a loop. It populates just something. Or it uh, could be algorithms which are meaningfully infinite. Like uh, suppose you compute the numbers of pi, number pi, compute the digits, always have the next digit. Or even in real practice, say you have a server which uh, operates on the web, then the server should run forever. So the infinite computations. And as I said, a non-deterministic, well, as it's a formalization of what was said in the beginning of today's lecture, a non-deterministic Turing machine uh, solving a decision problem accepts the input if it stops successfully and yields yes at at least one trajectory. So, again, this is the same as a general definition, but uh, there we had some vague notion of an algorithm and what is an algorithm nobody knows. This formalized for Turing machine. And thus, the complement of an NP problem is in general not an NP itself. So um, yeah, let's, let, let's skip this for a moment. We'll first we'll discuss Turing thesis and then we'll return to our P and NP and co NP. So um, Turing machines form a complete computational model by the following Church Turing thesis. That any computation on a reasonable computer with computing device can be performed on a Turing machine. Um, so the status of this, uh, what they call thesis, is non-mathematical. But in a, it's not a theorem. But it's not a theorem in a different way than, say, uh, P not equal NP is. So if you have P and NP, polynomial, not polynomial, an intrinsic polynomial, it's a concrete question whether these two classes coincide, whether any problem, non deterministic polynomial, can maybe deterministically polynomial. But uh, the problem is just not solved mathematically. It's an open question. This thing, it's uh, say globally recognized as a true fact, but it's not a mathematical theorem due to the fact that this uh, reasonable computing device are not a mathematical notion. So if you imagine any other model of computation, maybe you've heard about counter machines, Minsky machines, maybe you've heard about random access memory machines in some computational courses, uh, some Markov algorithms or anything else, or just a, re just a real computer like that, then you can formalize the way how a computing is going on there and prove that anything which can be solved here can be solved by a Turing machine. This is going to be a mathematical theorem. It will be enormously tedious to do it because you need to formally encode all the instructions of your processor or your assembler as a Turing machine command. This is really not maybe so nice to try to do it, really say, naturally, but uh, on the other side, it's theoretically possible. But this strange quantifier, any here, any, uh, this makes it not a mathematical theory, because nobody knows, uh, we can invent, um, say, informal models of, comp models of computation which go beyond Turing machines, just can have an oracle which solves something else. So, yeah, if you if you have a Turing machine, there are problems which are decidable on Turing machines, and there are problems which are not decidable on Turing machines. You can take such a problem and suppose that you have a magic box which solves it. You add it into your computational model, you get a computational model which um, solves more than Turing machines, right? But uh, in practice, nobody has invented such things. No physical machine can be, do more than a Turing machine, even quantum computers. So, um, moreover, the computation is polynomial. It can be also performed polynomial on the Turing machine. The degree of the polynomial can grow, but uh, nevertheless, it can be theoretically performed, right? So, 
And this is how it, what, what is the church theory thesis. This is a polynomial church theory thesis. It's less well recognized than the usual one. And say for quantum computers, it's po possibly it's not true. So for quantum computing, they still obey a church theory thesis. So anything which can be computed on a quantum computer actually can be computed on a classical computer. That is on a Turing machine. But there could be an uh, exponential blow up here. Because modeling the quantum processes involves some brute forces around the number of states. So this is more, more vague, but we do it. The degree of polynomial could change. So having the church during thesis, we may think that being polynomial means that you can solve it on the Turing machine and the number of steps is bounded by a polynomial. And we can always uh, suppose that this machine stops in polynomial number of steps because if it performs more and doesn't give you an answer, you can just cut off and say no. And non-deterministic po polynomial means that uh, your, or FP, uh, means that there's a non-deterministic Turing machine which does the job. Again, so uh, in all places where I said algorithm before, now you say Turing machine. Nothing else changes. And now we return to this slide and uh, we are going to discuss the complement. So uh, if you have the complement of an NP problem, so just flipping the result. So if you have, if you had yes, you will say and say no. If you had no, you say yes. For example, non-satisfiability problem. It is in general not in NP itself, right? Yeah, because uh, it's uh, the NP class is not symmetric up to complement, right? Is this understandable? Some, something uh, like not NP problem is not in NP itself. Yes, the the dual tree. So if you want to check for satisfiability. You have this hint which says satisfiable, right? But if you want to check for not satisfiability, you, you don't have a hint because your hint should make you. No. And the, you see that uh, if you are polynomial, it doesn't matter what answer you give, yes or no, it's symmetric. Here, the angel wants you to give answer yes. So if you want to, if your wish is to give, get answer no, that guy will not help you, it will, it will become a demon. It will, it will make you fail. And there is a classical example in the dual NP problem, current NP problem, it's tautologicity. So checking the tabula formula is a tautology is a typical co-NP problem. Like SAT is a typical NP problem. Why? Well, because if your problem is not a tautology, that can be easily validated by showing a falsifying assignment, right? But if the problem is a tautology, we don't know how to put it into NP class. OK, so uh, we are close to the end of today's class. I think we'll end it earlier because this is quite theoretically say packed. We uh, had many new notions. We discussed Turing machines, graphs, and the notion of PNP completeness. So um, just quickly for Cook Levin, set NP complete. And there will be uh, a proof sketch that shows how to having a, a satisfiability problem to reduce it. OK, let's just first I will answer the question in chat. Um, avoiding worst cases when we apply these reductions. So for the first question, the question was in the when we applied reductions, how do we avoid, avoid the worst cases? Well, it's not a matter of uh, our reductions, it's matter that we are lucky. And the case where we really did it, it was not the worst case. Our reduction didn't obtain it, but it's it could be not the case, and then why am I think. For the recommended resources, um, I will not answer right now, but I will uh, put some links on the web page, maybe in, uh, till the end of the week. OK, so we finish now by uh, Cook Levin. And uh, we're convening in 25 minutes, I think, something like that, for the practical class today.